Okay, so um, we're here to talk about the Harris Corner ponds, and specifically, I'm looking at pond design and construction. That's the that's the main issue tonight. Just hopefully to address some of the questions that you might have about the process. So I'll move on fairly quickly through the slides. And first, I'm going to set my timer so that I don't run over time. Okay, so. Um, just in terms of the context and the aims for the Harris Corner Pond, very briefly, all over the country, wetlands and bogs have been drained and small boggy corners have been drained down. And when we change the landscape, when we change the, the, that, that capacity of the landscape to soak up water like a sponge, we get flooding occurring like in Ennis in 2011 and drying out completely in small streams and ponds when, um, when there's low flow. So that's one of the challenges that exist in the country at the moment in terms of water quality. Also, a lot of pollution entering waterways from farms, from septic tanks, from roadways, that can lead to nitrate and phosphate increases and lead to BOD and suspended solids getting into waterways. And that generally reduces the habitat value for, for ecology generally. So runoff of microplastics, of oil, grease, grit, anything from streets and stuff, that all adds to the challenge. So since 1987, there at the bottom left of the slide, if I can show you my mouse, since the earliest records for, um, for water quality, 91 bad quality rivers and streams existed, and those have reduced steadily over the years, which is a very good thing. But during the same time period, the number of high quality waters has also dropped, which isn't such a good thing at all. So here in County Clare, we can see the dots of the river water quality corresponding to the different areas around the county. You can see the absence of rivers up around the burn itself. But throughout the county, if you imagine that most aquatic um, insects and fish and aquatic life generally needs very clean water quality in order to thrive and to survive, those would be the blue dots. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done around the countryside. And one of the ways that we can help to restore the ecological balance for, for waterways is by introducing ponds in our own farms and in our own gardens to provide a haven for wildlife. So that's the, the context that we're looking at. There's a lot of different farm scale solutions that can be adopted for cleaning up water. And what we'll specifically look at today is ponds, specifically ponds for farms or for, or for other um, land holdings, including gardens. So this is a stormwater pond in East Cork, and you can see already how it traps the sediment in the base of it. It's running off an industrial yard. There's a lot that leave, there's a lot to be desired for ecology in this pond. The banks are very steep, is the, is the main one actually. But other than that, what it provides is a storage space for silt to settle and to become cleaned as it goes through the catchment. So by the time the water flows off the industrial park, and on into the river, the stream just beside it, it's a lot cleaner by the time it gets into the receiving water. And you can see that there's natural dynamics that take place. So as soon as water flows out of those pipes, it settles in open drains, the grit begins to settle out, the silt then settles out further, the plants encroach and grow into the water, they provide a, a further haven for wildlife, and they also take up nitrates and phosphates. So the, the plants and the settlement space, they all provide valuable dynamics for improving the quality of water. Now, with the Hare's Corner Pond, we're looking more at clean water ponds, but I think it's important to keep silt traps as a potential pond type in mind as well. And there's a number of ways to approach it. One is a, a linear pond like this one in North Cork, where the farmer has literally just widened the drain. You can see at the far end of the drain, he's made a bit of a dam to retain the drain and made the base level. So the base soil has been pulled out from the sides and it's actually been used to build up the level at the further end so that it's holding water all the way along. So when you just turn around and look upstream, this is what you see earlier on. And then a year later, that's thickened up a lot with wetland plants that help to filter the water. Now, while we're looking at ponds rather than marshes, marshes can be very useful as a pre-filter system before the water flows into your pond. So it's worth keeping it in mind. So we look at design and location and how do we how do we select the location for our pond? There's a project in the UK called a million, the Million Ponds Project. And they've, they've basically said that we're at liberty to use their fact sheets for tonight's talk, which I'm very grateful for, rather than reinvent the wheel, because there's a lot of very, very good guidance in that. And the, the web link that's shown there is on a lot of the coming pages. So you'll have lots of time to take that down if you want to. 
And the fact sheets that they look at are very valuable. The pond's design, location, planning, construction, and aftercare. And those are, the, those are some of the details that we'll look at tonight. So they're looking specifically at clean water ponds. So rather than having inflow from septic tanks, from roadways, from plowed fields, or fields that have a lot of cattle, there's, there's, they're specifically looking for cleaner landscapes, essentially, without a lot of those stormwater inputs. In my own work, what I often focus on is ponds as a silt trap and as a filter system. And so I'd be looking specifically at the upper picture and trying to figure out how do we put ponds into the landscape to filter the water? Whereas for the Hare's Corner, it's more clean water ponds that we're looking at in many respects. But both are very, very valuable. So keep an open mind on, on, you know, on, on either of those approaches. So in terms of where to put a pond, digging ponds near other wetlands can improve the connectivity for wildlife. So it improves the corridor that wildlife can use to get through the landscape. And also where there's uncommon species, just you know, riparian species, just the, the wetland species around the habitat, that can help, particularly if there's unusual ones, to strengthen the populations. Now that's more detailed than we're going into at the moment. So another way to phrase the top two bullet points for our purposes is, well, dig the pond where you've got the space on your own land. You know, if we don't have access to the whole country, then where do we dig a pond within our own farm or within our own garden? And very often that's down to other landscape features rather than looking to improve wetland connectivity. And it'll still do that. They'll still act as a springboard um, for wildlife to go to and from wetlands from other areas around, the, around where you live. There's another factor, a number of factors that they outline as well. Don't dig ponds where there are existing wetland habitats. Don't dig them where they might damage existing species. Don't dig, dig up peat and don't dig up archaeological heritage. So these are all issues that we'll look at as we go through the, the slides in a bit more detail. On my own field in the Hinch, we've actually got peat. That's what's there. And at a certain stage, it, it's valid to create ponds within those environments as well. In this context, if we dig up, if we dig up peat, ex by exposing peat, we liberate that carbon into the air. So there's a climate change issue. And digging up ponds where there's existing wetland habitats, to my mind, that's often actively beneficial. And indeed, some of the million ponds information does outline that as well. So we need to, to, to be just careful at how we proceed near existing wetland habitats rather than ruling them out you know, at, at, at the first stage. So similarly here, they're looking at damp hollows, small flushes and seepage springs, old ponds. If there's particularly old habitats already on the land, I think that that's mainly what they mean when you're building new ponds. Whereas if there's, you know, if there's areas that flood, but they're actually part of the farm, they might be perfectly acceptable to dig. So again, it's a matter of looking at the ecology of the area and seeing, is it an appropriate place to work? One of the farms that we looked at as part of the Hare's Corner visits was on a bog and just reflooding that bog and creating wet areas is, actively beneficial for the wildlife rather than letting that bog remain drained. So where it's appropriate, rewetting can be quite a constructive thing to do. So again, I just flag this, if you do have the capacity to build additional wetlands within the space, then go for it. And if you don't, it's possible that with care, building it near or within existing drains and the like can be actively beneficial as well. So the, the advice they have is, is also, like the photographs here are, you know, wet areas within grassland and wet areas within woodlands and within scrubby areas and within wetlands already, and sometimes making those bigger. So I'd, I'd love to have an interview with them and just find out what the, what's the guiding principle in terms of how to, how to follow one guidance or the next. But, um, but there are lots of good areas. There's a, a general principle, you know, if it's wet, make it wetter. That, that can also often work on the land, which isn't what the, what the, what the One Million Pond project is looking for. They're looking mainly for new ponds to join up with old ponds. But I think in our scenario, I think that there's a lot of scope for making wet areas wetter, even within our context here. Similarly in moorland and bogland and around farmland generally, and in garden ponds, there's a lot of potential to, to put in constructive ponds um, quite easily, you know, within those areas in a way that's good for biodiversity. But care is needed in order not to do more harm than good, particularly when you're working within areas of existing habitat. If you're looking at an area of lawn that gets damp, that's probably an ideal way to work, even if it's a damp area of lawn, you know, if, or if it's heavily grazed ground, for example. 
So if you're taking a habitat out of you know, intensive grazing and you're putting it into pond work, that's probably a good thing if from a habitat perspective. One thing to bear in mind is that wildlife will generally exist in the very shallow water. So what they're suggesting here is that it's only in the top two centimeters. That's where most of the interest is for wildlife and wetland species. So while a big pond is good, and using the same area for lots of small pocket ponds might even be better. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're working. And similarly, the edge slope is something to keep in mind. If the edge slope is too, is too steep, then, um, then you reduce the habitat availability. Now, having said that, if the edge slope is too shallow, you also run the risk of making the pond very small or having an area that encroaches and becomes marshland very quickly. So it's a bit of a balance and possibly shallow areas in some parts of the pond, steeper areas in others. So a balance might work quite well. And similarly, this illustration here at the bottom showing an asymmetrical profile, it just shows, again, like I outlined, you've got a shallow area at one side, a deepish pool, and then a steeper section at the other side. So having that variation can often be very good. And again, if you've got a clean entry into the water, it limits the, the, the margins, the drawdown zone. Whereas if you've got a very wide and potentially undulating drawdown zone, that can be so much the better for, um, for wildlife generally. So keep that in mind as you design your pond. And the different plants that grow in those areas will be different. So in the shallow areas, the medium depths, and then the deeper water, they'll all support a different flora and consequently different fauna, different insects and fish potentially within the pond. Now, in terms of islands, one of the issues that they raise is that if islands are too high, they tend to dry out and trees can develop on them quite quickly. And the challenge with trees is that if you get magpies or rooks sitting in the trees, waiting for uh, nesting birds, for example, to rise from the marshy areas, then they can just swoop straight down and eat the eggs, for example. So if you don't have trees, very often you don't have trees in bogland, for example. And in that scenario, the, the ground nesting birds are just better protected. But islands can also be beneficial for lots of wildlife. And it's possible that just keeping the trees trimmed might be one way to deal with that. Now, one thing that they mentioned is that good communication with contractors is, is essential. The pond on the right is what a neat, clean, competent machine driver has done on a particular project that they cited as an example. The pond on the left was actually the one that was designed. So on the left-hand side, there's undulating edges, there's varying depths, there's you know, there's, there's a, an uneven entry and exit from the pond. Um, there's, a, there's a longer edge, um, ed, um, what's the word, edge length. The perimeter of the left-hand pond is longer because of the undulations in the, in the plan view as well. And while the one on the right looks grand and neat, it, it doesn't provide the same interest, interest for wildlife. So the, the left-hand one is the one that's, that's, the, that's the superior for wildlife, if you like. So it's important just to communicate the aims with your contractor when you're doing it and preferably to draw up a plan. So with that in mind, it's no harm having a drawing of the area that you have in mind. And tonight we'll provide details on that and just some suggestions for you. But ideally what you do is you do a scale map of the area that you have in mind specifically and how you'd like it to look. So I'm, going, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but what I will say is the notes will be provided, um, they'll be emailed out to you, and you'll be able to look at those afterwards and just follow through these details. But basically a sketch for a contractor, preferably with a cross section, will show what you want to convey. Or you can give these um, slides to a contractor and just to ask them to look through them before they start work. But a drawing can just convey the ideas much more easily than just doing it verbally. Something to bear in mind is that if you've got a designated site, this is a UK website, by the way, so um, we don't have SSIAs in the same way, but it's SACs and PNHAs, so Special Areas of Conservation and Proposed Natural Heritage Areas are the main ones here. But if it's a designated site, then work should be planned very carefully and only in consultation with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. So within the time frame of the Harris Corner, we're just much cleaner staying out of SACs and NHAs. If there's tree felling or pruning, that needs to be considered. Licensing needs to be um, considered. Planning permission, if you go deeper or higher than a meter, generally planning is required. Follow all the, you know, the necessary health and safety for your project, just to take care with machine, um, machine time. Just, you know, the usual thing, just make sure you can be seen and that you're working safely. If there's protected species in, in an area, that's an issue. I didn't notice any while I was around. 
I'm not an ecologist though, but Karen is with me and she is. So we didn't notice any protected species in the areas that we're considering working. If we're working in a floodplain, um, permission is sometimes needed. Again, it's not an area in any of the spaces that we looked at as part of our site visits. And if there's services like power lines or gas lines, they need to be just identified and make sure that we're working with care within that area. Now, one of the things to bear in mind is that there's a number of ways to, to approach pond creation. What we're looking at in the context of this project is the quick approach, you know, just to get in with the machine, dig a couple of holes and get out again and leave it be. That's number one there. There is also the possibility to do a phased approach, particularly if we don't know what the final water levels will be. So you can always dig your pond in year one and then return in year two to assess it, to see, or do we need a plastic liner, do we not? And, uh, and just to make tweaks to the outer, the outer edges. And a longer term approach that we keep an eye on it every few years. And, and if there's work that's needed, just to tweak it as we go along. So I'm gonna move on to the construction process. Actually, there's one issue there. Timing the works, just planning the construction phase. It says there's no best time for pond creation. Bear in mind that if you're interfering with a natural habitat, then working outside of the nesting season is good. So having all works completed before March will be important from that point of view. And making sure that there's access for machinery. Dealing with spoil is one of the things that we we'll mention as we go along. And with topsoil, I'd say if you can just remove the topsoil and use it in your garden or in your farm, that's the best thing to do. And then work with subsoil from then on in. So in terms of the construction, um, let me see the phases of construction initially just mark out the area so that the machine knows where he's going and knows what he's doing. And if there's site plans and drawings, so much the better. That's very useful. A number of copies of them so that they get dirty. Talking with the contractor is very important just to communicate what's going on. And let me see. Yeah, checking, just being there, being there quite regularly. I mean, ideally, somebody from the, the project would be there on site, but we just simply don't have the resources for that. We're much better off putting the the, you know, the funds that we do have into the pond construction rather than into a lot of supervision for a lot fewer pond projects. So a lot of the responsibility will rest with yourselves just in terms of keeping an eye on the work and seeing how it carries along. So the rest of it will be dealt with as we go forward. So I'll, I'll leave those there as notes and we'll just carry straight on to the, to the next stage of construction. So these are some drawings that I've done up Based, on, based on, our, on our meetings, actually, is we've gone around the county and looked at various sites. So if you've got high groundwater, for example, if your groundwater is close to the surface, it might be an easy matter simply to dig out your pond area and remove the soil, remove the soil to somewhere else within the pond. So you're clearing the topsoil, remo removing that to your garden, digging out your subsoil, and removing that somewhere to, close by, and then softening the edges for wildlife. You can see there's a bit of a drop here where the top of the, where, the, where, we're, where we're not actually um, below the water table, and then it shallows off as we hit the water table. So there's a good wide margin here for the variability of the water depth. And then we get a little bit deeper again. And don't alter the ground level by more than a meter, or you know, there's the, the potential for a planning issue. Where you've got high ground water, it's very easy simply to leave an island in the middle. That's not, not difficult, particularly when no liner is used. And it's also very easy just to do pocket ponds around the edges and create a mosaic of habitats within your area. Now, if you do need a liner, if you've got free draining soil, then a liner is going to be necessary. So the liner is the red line shown in the, in the section view only in each of these. And the orange line that you see, that's where we're placing our spoil. So we're digging our spoil out of the central area, remove the topsoil from the whole area first and use that somewhere else in your garden, then remove the subsoil from the central area and lay that very carefully around the outer perimeter and level it off. Then you can drape your liner into the excavation and then you can backfill with soil in on top of the liner. So I typically backfill with about six inches of soil in on top of my liner again to provide good habitat for amphibians, for insects and for plants to root within the area. So if you've got variability of groundwater, you may want to put in a liner in the lower section, but your groundwater still varies. It still rises and falls throughout the season. So you get a permanent pool in the base, but during the winter months, your water level might rise up well above your, pond, your liner level. And then when it drops again in the summer, 
it might drop back down to your liner top edge. Keep in mind when you're constructing that your liner top edge should be the same level all the way around. If you've got it a foot deeper in one area than the other area, then all of your water will be at the lower level. That's something just to keep in mind as you're doing your construction. If you're on a slope, then make sure that the runoff from the upper slope can flow down in over the top of your liner and into your pond area, and then bring your liner up above the ground level at the lower end of your slope, and use your excavated spoil then at the, low, at the lower edge of your pond, and you can mound it up to create a, a large horseshoe all around your pond to catch that water. And if you want to increase the amount of water feeding in, you can always dig trenches, swales to the left and right of gradient so that it traps the runoff water coming off your field. So if you're creating a sloping, if you're creating a pond on a sloping site with heavy clay or with peaty soils, again, digging out your pond area and mounding it up in the lower section. This is particularly useful for clay soils, or if you're dealing with peat for blocking and, and um, blocking dams mostly within a, an existing peat bog. But, um, but the same principle applies. Bear in mind that if it's peat, if this is a horseshoe and peat, if it dries out, it'll decay over time, the carbon will be liberated to the atmosphere, and this area here will reduce in height over time. So mound it well up. Ideally, it'll be used for heavy clay soils. So you're clearing the whole area under the pond, sorry, over the pond and over your mound. You're clearing the topsoil out of the way. Then you're digging out your, your clay subsoil and you're mounding up here clay on clay. So your clay from your excavation meets clay that's been cleared and had the topsoil taken off. And then you roll this area very, very carefully. So you're getting a really, really well compacted earthen mound below your pond. And in that way, the water can rise right up to the top of your berm and be held back. So you're holding more water than you would if you just had to go digging, digging forever, basically. Um, so so you're, you're, you're essentially getting a combination of your excavation and your mound build in order to increase your pond depth and increase your water holding over the years. And again, with the island in the middle, that's easy enough to do if you've got a, um, what's it called? If you've got heavy clay soils. Now, one of the things that the million ponds information says is potentially to avoid drains. If there's, it's just simply to route drains around the pond. If there's the potential for pollution coming in. Personally, I, I quite like cleaning up the habitat if I possibly can. So I quite like to take in drains that are in the area and use the pond as a silt trap and simply budget on cleaning it over every five years if, um, you know, if there is silt coming down into your catchment area. So with that in mind, these drawings just show a pond excavated within an existing drain. And let me see. So this is on relatively flat land. On sloping ground, you might want to plug your drain and bring your, and route a new drain around the outside so that you're not eroding the new embankment that you're making. Or if you've got the potential to, you could build up a large embankment on the lower side and have it trickling out over the top of the embankment and again, rejoining the drain outside of the main channel. So you're not getting erosion early on. In these areas here, it might be no harm putting in a sod if the flow is low, you know, put in a sod with grass in it just to protect the base from erosion. And you can do quite a small, modest pond size by simply digging out the edges of your drain and plugging the lower section and capping the top of that plug with, um, with a grassy sod. Again, just to protect the soil from erosion. If you're working within an existing peat bog, again, you can plug your peat drain. You can dig out a small pocket pool away from the main channel and then plug your drain so that you hold water back behind it within the channel. Or if you own the land you know, on both sides, if you've got a mound here and a mound here and you're not likely to flood anybody, you can build two plugs within your drains and potentially flood quite a large area in order to make a, a pond within your bog area. And then within an existing mound, for example, you can create a you know, six inch or four inch dip in that mound and have the water trickling off and out into the perimeter drain. So in terms of spoil disposal, one of the things that suggested in the Million Ponds work is to create embankments um, at the outer edge so that your machine can work from the outside and just to protect the pond from, from muddy water washing in really. And then similarly, taking surface runoff 
and carrying it around the area, preventing the water entering in groundwater ponds. Again, this slightly, it slightly gets away from, from what I'd like to see, which is more filtration of water in the landscape generally. But if you can do both, so much the better. If you can create, if you can build a marshy area here to filter that water, well and good. And then you've got a cleaner pond within here for your, for your clean water flora and fauna. Similarly, spoil can be disposed of in the lower embankment. Bear in mind, that again, these are British guidance. You know, if you go above two hectares, it's a reservoir, et cetera. I'm not sure what the figure is here, but basically what you want to avoid, you want to make sure that if the dam breaks, you're not flooding all of your neighbors. You know, so that's something to keep in mind. So the, the, the idea here is that it's quite a modest build, you know, and that if the dam breaks, it simply washes down the hill down to the bottom of the ditch and doesn't do any damage anywhere. With the phased approach, again, in year one, you can dig out the area. Year two, check your water levels. Year three, um, you know, break up the ground a bit to make it uneven so that it increases the habitat value. Again, it's not really what we're looking at in the Harris Corner, but it's there as an idea if anybody is running with these, with these projects into the long term. Now, if there's services, if there's existing field drains, the suggestion in the Harris Corner is to route those around. My preference would be to open them up and use the pond as a filter. But again, it depends on whether you want the pond to be a filter or whether you want it to be a clean water pond. So this is another perspective on, on how to approach that. And again, simply just keep in mind the health and safety, make sure you're seen on site. That's the main thing there on the left-hand photograph. And Azola, the pond fern, that can cover water very, very quickly. And there's bulrush in the foreground. Bulrush are great, they're a native species. Um, I use them a lot for constructed wetlands. But it, they, they're quite invasive, you know, they'll spread into the water very, very quickly. So it might be no harm just to keep an eye on those and remove them in the early years to make sure that they don't um, take over your whole pond area. And the azolea is a, an, an introduced plant that spreads very quickly and covers the water. Mainly just keep an eye and if you get invasive species of any sort, just rake them out. In terms of islands, you can leave islands in the middle if you're doing a lot of ponds. This is well bigger than our Harris Corner um, spec, if you like. But if you can shave off the top of those islands in the middle, so much the better, and deepen the whole area. It, it allows for greater variation throughout the year and, um, and seasonal pools. There's also the one bucket pond, which is exactly how it sounds. Dig a bucket and drive away, you know? And, and it, it can literally be that easy, that straightforward, you know, and create pockets of bogs, or pockets of pools around a field area. So as your machine driver is leaving, you can just, you know, dig a scoop, throw it to one side and, um, and just, you know, create different spaces for habitats within the area. So pond management, very, very briefly, different ponds will thicken up, will, will encroach in different times. So if there's a stream going through it, even a clean stream, it'll thicken up much more quickly. Whereas if it's a groundwater pond or a pond with no inflow, the encroachment can be much, much slower over a longer period of time. After pond creation, one of the main things here that they suggest is specifically not to plant the pond. Now, I've been offering pond plants, so we'll talk about those in a minute, but not planting ponds offers an awful lot of value to the species that particularly like the wet bare soil at the edge. So that's well worth considering. It also means that you can keep an eye on your pond and see how it behaves over time. There's a sense of excitement to dig in a pond and then finding out what species show up in a given week and just watching it over time. Temporary fencing might be needed. Um, management in later years, you may need to dig them out if they've been, um, if there's streams going through them, just to bear those in mind. If there are streams coming in, it can be an easy matter just to plant up those streams or those drains. And th these are a couple of method methods for just digging up drains and making them um, more effective at a, as, a, as a water filter within the landscape. Simply dig out the area just upstream in the drain, make a small little dam and plant up behind it. So it's very, very straightforward. And these notes, as I say, you'll be sent. Similarly, if you've got runoff coming from a field, if you can filter it through a wooded buffer zone or marsh buffer zone before it gets into your pond, so much the better. And similarly, swales within the landscape can help to catch water and convey it down in towards your pond. These are the bulrush. They grow very effectively underneath the soil through quick growing rhizomes. They can be very invasive, great for big ponds, but probably better off to keep an eye out for them in smaller ponds and just weed them out initially. 
this is common reed, also too big and, and potentially treacherous for your liner material. If you're using a liner, they can grow very effectively and they've got a very sharp root. This is the one that's used for thatching. Branched burr reed, that can be quite, quite invasive as well. These are the species that I tend to use for reed bed systems and constructed wetlands. Um, probably encroaching too quickly on small ponds, but they can be very, very pretty plants. The yellow flag iris, this grows very effectively on marshy ground as well as within the pond area. And it's very pretty and it also doesn't spread too quickly. And the water mint is another lovely low growing plant that looks amazing. Just in terms of pond examples, these are a couple of, if you like, trial and error mistakes that were made. There were ponds dug in an area where there wasn't enough um, so th there wasn't enough clay in the soil, so they tended to empty out quite quickly after the rain fell. And in this area here, there was a spoil bank <clears throat> made around the pond, which meant that the surface water from around the area couldn't actually get into the pond to replenish it. So by removing that spoil and removing it to downstream of that area, it would still allow the runoff from the surrounding area to come into the pond and to replenish it over time. This is a pond in UL that I was involved in planting a good number of years ago. Again, relatively shallow edges around the outside and um, a certain amount of introduced plants because it was mainly a filter wetland as part of a filter pond for the Thoman village campus. And wildlife certainly liked it. This is a mother duck with her family on one of those ponds shortly after we did the planting. This is a pond in Bagley State in Limerick. And again, it's built within an OPW drainage channel area. There's a river on the other side and as part of a wetland complex built for the city council. And again, the, the bank slopes here at one side are quite steep. So we've left some areas that are a little bit shallower, but what we were trying to do here was maximize the area again, at more of a filter pond, but still very valuable for wildlife within that context. This is a, a stormwater pond specifically for stormwater in my column in Galway. This is the, this is a, a 60 acre area that's just north of the, the Shannon tunnel. And this was an area that we designed to return to wildlife. And again, here you can see the very, very shallow nature of this area, partly willow scrub and partly ponds. One of the things I particularly like here is this area where the water spills over. And with the simple replacement of a small amount of soil here, maybe half an hour with a machine, we opened up a whole new pond complex here that was very shallow and wasn't there before. And the islands are star shaped in order to provide shelter for waterfowl, regardless of the wind direction. And you can see the very, very shallow margins on this. It's slightly bigger than the budgets we have available at the moment, but it just gives an example of good, good shallow edges. And here's another one in Cork. Again, this was just simply a matter of making a dam within an existing field, pretty much, and worked very effectively within a, a new development. And it can be as simple as just digging, you know, digging small little pocket pools and building dams. And while these look like pocket ponds at the moment, they'll thicken up and become marshes but they can be very effective within the landscape as filters and also for wildlife. This is my own pond, my garden here just beside me. And again, you can do a lot with a, with a tiny little uh, wildlife pond. And again, it's good for newts, for frogs, for all manner of water beetles, even though the edge slope is relatively shallow. It, um, you know, if all you've got space for is a shallow area, then you know, it's a lot better than nothing. So very, very briefly, Plan your pond, draw your design, make the edges shallow and undulating, allow for seasonal variation in depths, remove invasives if you get them, and enjoy the process. You know, enjoy the wildlife and the peace and quiet and the sunlight on the water. You know, there's a lot to be, a lot to be said for ponds. Make sure that you don't flood your neighbors if you're, drop, if you're blocking drains, that's very important, and don't create a safety hazard. So very, very deep slopes leading straight down to duckweed. Um, covering your pond can be quite a safety hazard, just to be wary of that. Don't remove, in good don't remove good habitat if it's there, but don't overthink it all. It's better to have a first draft of a pond in the ground. You know, do something, and then we'll learn from the process. So this is draft one. So we get to make all the mistakes, and then draft two, we'll be able to show photographs of ponds and just show tweaks and how to move forward and how to amend and change as we move forward into the future. So this is a photo I took in Denmark of a stormwater pond, just taking fresh water off the landscape. And um, my daughter trying to bounce up and down on a very, very hefty log that's been sliced. It's a tree sliced in two and literally just placed right across the pond. This is part of a cycle path in Denmark. It just shows the, 
the difference in health and safety. Um, I can't imagine that being allowed as a local authority cycle path or walkway in the Irish context. But you know, speed the day. I think let us take risks and enjoy ourselves more than more than being you know wrapped up in cotton wool all the time. So those are my slides, and um, I'm going to stop sharing here. And I would welcome any questions that you'd have. So just place your questions in the Q and A box below, and we'll we'll work away from there. Thank you so much, Phelim. That was excellent. I've learned a lot again today. It was brilliant. Um, excellent training session. Has so much information in it. Um, I suspect it's been extremely useful for everyone that decided to come on board and join us for the Harris Corner uh, Pond project as a pond applicant. So thanks very much for that. Um, before I'm uh, before I'm going to ask if anyone has a question, which you've already done. Uh, I'm just going to repeat for everyone that joined the webinar after my introduction that we are recording this session. Um, and I will send the link to the link to the presentation to all the participants. Uh, so don't worry if you've missed the beginning of Phelan's presentation. Um, I guess we can start um, the question session with a question that came in by email uh, about pond liner life expectancy, if you would want to comment on that. Then for everyone else, if you have a question, I can see them appearing in the Q&A. So just put them in the Q&A or raise your hand and I will unmute your microphone and you can talk to Phelim yourself. Go ahead, Phelim. Okay, so in terms of, in terms of pond liner longevity, I just following a very, very brief internet search, you know, while we were still setting up this, this call, I was looking it up and somewhere between, you know, 20 and 30 years was what was recommended, longer for EPDM or something like that. Now, having said that, if you bury a polythene in the ground, it tends to last a lot longer than if you leave it exposed to sunlight. So even if you've got a pond liner that uses polytunnel plastic or even four layers of silage pit cover plastic, you know, good new silage pit cover plastic, something along those lines can still, I, I would argue, last quite a long time because you don't have the degrading quality of sunlight on it. And if you keep common reed and bulrush out of your pond, then most of the other roots that are there will be okay. And if you protect the liner, I'd expect that you'd probably get 30, 40 years out of liner. And even after that, it's difficult to know whether if the liner gets punctured, whether it'll actually cause trouble. It might just, you know, the, the water levels might oscillate a little bit more during the summer, but it still may not be a problem because if you get a little bit of leakage, we get a lot of rainfall in Ireland generally in order to top up the pond over time. So I don't know if it answers the question. It gives a general brush stroke of an answer, but, um, but it, that, that's as much as I know at the moment. My, my own pond liner, I, I noticed that the water levels started going down more and more over time. So I dug out my pond, dug out all the soil, pulled out the liner, checked it for leaks. I found tiny little pinholes in it. I'd been throwing in boxes of wetland plants into it over time and maybe, you know, the, some of the grit and stones snagged on the liner. But actually, the biggest thing I think was that the alder roots that were planted right beside the pond grew in over the top of the liner and dipped their toe into the water and drank all the water out. I think it was mostly alder roots rather than leakage. So, um, you know, be wary of trees growing immediately beside your pond. Sure, you just have to keep an eye on it. And it's a lot of trial and error. And it's fun as well. It's fun. Um, somebody's asking what's the ideal depth for a pond uh, with pond liner. I guess it's, I guess that goes for, for without pond liner as well. Go ahead. The ideal depth, the ideal depth for a pond if you're using a liner? Yeah, that's the question, but I'm, okay. I'm guessing the answer will be what's the ideal without a pond liner as well. Okay. For this, for this project. Yeah. Um, you can do a lot with two foot depth. Do you know? The, I'm conscious that the budget for this project is relatively modest. So a two foot liner depth, a two foot, let me see, a two foot pond depth will mean that your liner will need to be down about two and a half foot. And then you're replacing that with four inches or six inches of soil very gently and on top of your liner. Um, and ideally, if you are using a liner, you'd have a protective layer top and bottom of that so that you've got, um, you've got protection underneath and protection on top. So if you're using polytunnel plastic to use non-woven geotextile or even old, you know, old silage pit cover plastic, just something to act as a layer at the, top, at the bottom so that sharks don't, you know, don't push up through your liner and something protective on the top so you, when you're putting your soil back on, 
it isn't as easy to punch on the liner. But I'm, I'm guessing dig your pond about two and a half foot deep and then lay the liner and then put back on a little bit of subsoil, clean subsoil on top of that. Yep, sounds very straightforward to me. Uh, there's somebody uh, here also asking uh, if you could tell in advance um, if pond lining will be required, if you want to comment on that, and if it's discovered subsequently that it's needed, can it be added a year later? I guess it can. Yeah. What I do on that, sure. What I, what I do with that, I take that slow approach. I'd start by digging it in year one. And I'd say, okay, let's dig it out. And, um, you know, so remove the, the topsoil, remove the subsoil, move them down slope or somewhere further away, and then just track back and forth into your base if you think that you've got enough, um, enough clay content in the, in the soil. There are ways to check the clay content. If you look up the One Million Ponds Project and look up the section on liners, there's a way of checking the clay content in your soil by mixing the soil through a jar of water and seeing what proportion of that is fines at the bottom of your jar. But it, you know you can suck it and see. If your field is boggy or wet or heavy, then maybe just digging it out and rolling it will, will work. If you've got rabbits digging in your field, chances are it's not gonna be wet enough. You know, So there's ways of telling, but basically I, I suck it and see, I, I dig my area, line it like, you roll it like that machine. And then a year later, no planting, and a year later, come back and see how's it doing? You know, how's it performing? And then at that stage, it's very easy just to buy a liner, lay it out, get a machine for half a day to replace some topsoil, some subsoil back on top of it just to protect it. And don't use topsoil on your liner, use clean subsoil um, because topsoil will be too nutrient rich and you want a pond that's relatively nutrient poor. Thanks for the question. Brilliant, Fem. Um, I hope I hope I, I think that answered the question. If not, you can always find us by email. Um, there is another question here that says, "What lining material do you recommend?" I feel like we have loads of questions about uh, pond liner. Yeah. Maybe if you just yeah. want to sure. briefly touch on that again, because I feel like that's that's an issue for lots of people. Okay. Thank. Yeah, that's an important one. Um, what I've got is builders plastic at the bottom of my pond, you know, with a protective layer of some other plastic on top of that. And builder's plastic has a tendency to tear, you know, it'll rip along a seam. So it's not ideal. Polytunnel plastic is much stronger in tension. So that's a better plastic. But again, it's very, very light. You know, it needs protection. Standard pod liners are called butyl rubber. It's actually a synthetic material called EPDM. And that's, a, that's an effective one for a small pond area. That's your standard pond liner that you'd get from a garden center. You can also buy PVC, but generally I tend to avoid PVC, even though it's a bit cheaper, because the manufacture and the disposal and the recycling of PVC are all toxic processes. So I'd rather just keep away from it. And let me see. The other, you can use 0 0.5 mil LDPE, low density polyethylene, and just buy a, a chunk of that. You know, for a five meter by five meter pond, if you buy a, say, seven meter by seven meter chunk of plastic that will that will do you but again they're quite expensive for for epdm and ldp and all those it can be 10 or 13 euros per square meter whereas polytunnel plastic is about two euros a square meter and silage pit cover plastic even if you have three layers of silage pit cover plastic you know those three layers will cost you about 50 cents a square meter so for my money, what I do is I do less rather than more. I dig out my area and see, will it work without a liner? And if you want a liner, then I'd go for silage pit cover plastic because it's easily available in the local hardware shop and or the local builders, um, what you call it, farm supply. And simply buy a sheet, you know, eight foot, what, 24 foot by 75 foot, I think was the smallest sheet that I could find recently. And if you fold that 75 meter length in three, fold it in and in again, that's 25 foot by 25 foot, you know, which is roughly eight meters by eight meters, which is about the right size. And that's three sheets of, of plastic in a single layer. And then just put old silage pit cover plastic on the base, put down your three new layers and, and then old silage pit cover plastic on the top as well. Not the bale wrap stuff, but the, the heavy duty um, pit cover. Um, yeah. Ask that question again if I missed anything or, or be more specific. Yeah, no, it's uh, I, we've noticed this in on site visits as well that there's a lot of questions about pond liners. So hopefully that 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 answered the question. That's great. Thanks. 
Um, there's an interesting question here uh, about ducks. So there's somebody that completed two, two ponds. Uh, these ponds are used by ducks. The question is, will they over pollute ponds? Now, if I can just comment on that quickly. Um, sure. Yes, so if you have a high density of, of ducks or geese in your pond, uh, they can be a problem because their droppings will increase the organic content of the ponds. Now, I don't think two ducks will actually be a will create a, a major problem for you. So, you know, you might want to keep an eye out for, you know, algae blooms or deterioration of the water quality, but in general, I wouldn't be worried about ducks. I would just really enjoy them. But go ahead, Phelan, if you want to comment on that a bit more. Yeah, I'd, I'd go with that as well. I mean, yes, if you have ducks, they will increase the nutrient load in the pond. But, you know, at a certain stage, enjoy the ducks. You know, it depends on what your, it depends on what your pond is for, you know. Um, and I think if they're, if they're going to enjoy it, there's going to be other species that will enjoy it as well, you know. But... It, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I it's, think tricky, it, it's tricky, it's tricky it is, yeah, but I think, but mostly enjoy them if they're yeah. beautiful mallards or anything like that. Just enjoy them. Keep an eye out for for crazy things that are happening in your pond. Um, thanks, Phelan. There's another question here. Uh, somebody's asking, can you talk about the evaporation in ponds with very shallow areas? Yeah, there will be evaporation, and if you've got trees around the area, that evaporation will increase. So if it's a clay-lined pond. If you do have trees, they'll, they'll drink a lot of water over the summer months. And so, let me see. Um, there will be a certain amount of evaporation and simply not to worry about it too much. You know, I, I know that, again, the one million ponds advice is simply to let ponds dry out in the summer. The reason why I dug mine out is because I thought it was drying out too much and I was topping it up with rainwater. And I don't know whether it's a good idea to top it up with rainwater or not. I think that um, rainwater is certainly better than chlorine, chlorinated tap water. It's, it's actively advised not to top your pond up with chlorinated tap water because the chlorine in the tap water is designed to kill bacteria and so it'll kill the microbes in your pond as well, which isn't a good idea at all. You're, you're wanting it to be as diverse as possible. So if you have a source of rainwater, well and good. Or if you can route your downpipe directly into your pond, that's, that's ideal, you know, at the start of a building project, just to bring your, your rainwater gutters straight down into a pond and let them top it up naturally. So whenever it rains, you get the pond topped up a little bit automatically. That can be very effective. But it, evaporation will occur and simply not to worry about it, you know, to let the margins dry out completely in the summer. Thank you, Phelim. Um, another question then, we have about seven minutes left. Um, somebody's asking, um, you, you said it's best to use subsoil uh, for putting soil back into the pond on top of the liner. How deep uh, a layer is needed and how extensive cover the full pond base okay. or is it just to protect the liner? Yeah, Thank okay. You. It's mainly protect the liner, but it's also to provide a rooting space for plants and it's also to provide a burrowing space for insects and for frogs and the like. So basically about six inches of soil over your liner and in terms of how extensive, if the middle of the pond is too far for a digger to reach, there's no need to cover that. But if it's easy to reach into the middle of the pond, then scatter your, you know, dry subsoil into the middle of the pond as well. And you do that work while the pond is still dry. And there's no need to tamp it down. There's no need to compress it or anything like that. Just to lay it very gently on the liner and then, and then leave it. And ideally, it would be kind of wavy at the edges. You know, you don't need to get it too too clean or too regular or anything like that. Yeah. I see that Great. Yep. Mike is asking, yep. do you recommend Another starting one. now? Uh, Mike is asking, do you recommend starting now or wait until spring? I need to go for it straight away. You know, I go for it straight away because you get a lot of feedback during the winter about the rainfall. Yeah, you know, and you the, the, the other place. reason is we need to start um, spending the money fair enough <laughs> and yeah <laughs> so the more people that build the better exactly yeah. yeah so you know you can basically start any time of year yeah any day of the year lovely and i see kenneth is asking how about topping up the pond with water yes from a private last well. question yeah, yeah. You, don't have the um, you don't even necessarily need to top it up you can just let the rain do it so that's another thing to do but you can certainly top it up if you wish 
and I, I'm I'm kind of very much coming. Yeah, I'm a plant supplier. Okay, so I'm talking myself out of work here. But basically, you can you can just leave it to pick it up naturally. You know, and just watch as the plants encroach. And similarly, you can let it top up naturally with water. How far away from the pond can the trees be planted? Patrick is asking. With that one, typically I'd say about three, four or five meters, something like that. Do bear in mind though, that if you plant in the near clay lined pond, that they'll, um, that they'll begin to, to soak up water. You know, Again, I wouldn't fret over it too much. It does rather depend on what the rainwater, or on what the water source is. If you've got a drain that's passing through the land, and if your pond is built within a drain, then you can have your trees right up against the outside of the drain, and they won't cause a problem because you'll have a lot of water coming in anyway. Whereas if it's rainwater fed, you may want to keep them further back. Karen, there's also a question. Let me see. There's a question yeah. in the main chat for you. Do you want me to read that? Yeah, go ahead. You can see that. Okay, there's a question. Let me see. What's the maximum recommended depth if you're planning to vary the depth of a series of ponds? The maximum recommended depth is, is one meter. Once you go beyond a meter, you're into a planning issue, technically. So if you don't vary the ground level by more than a meter, then, then you're, you don't have a planning issue. What you can do is you can dig down 95 centimeters and you can build a berm on a sloping site 95 centimeters. So your overall depth can be quite deep and, and still be within the planning guidelines. But if you're doing a variety of ponds, you know, even a one foot pond here and there can be, can be useful. And, and, and just to let a, a mosaic appear within the landscape. But yeah, in general terms, Maximum depth would be would be a meter. There's a there's two more questions in the main chat. Yeah, where do we source the soil yeah, to put on the liner? Yeah. Will I will I answer that one, Karen? Yeah. So, where do we source? It? Susan is asking where do we source the soil. So step one is mark out your area for your pond, including any part where you're dumping your soil immediately around it to make a berm. Step two is to dig out the clay material from the pond and pile that up on the area where you're building your berm. Step three, I suppose, is to dig out your pond a little bit more and to place your subsoil to one side, then lay your liner, and then take that set aside soil to put back in on top of your liner. So basically, if you want six inches of depth on top of the soil, on top of the liner, then dig out four or five inches of soil from the area. And once that's broken up, it'll be a little bit more, um, more volume. So that should answer Susan's question about that. You source the soil from within the bond itself. Yep, and then there's, so that was Susan's question. There's one more in that one that says, uh, in the, sorry, in the Q&A one, there's two more. Uh, if subsoil is very stony or rocky, could this cause an issue with pond liner? Yep, you can. And that's why your, underlayer of, of several sheets of, of underlayer of old used silage pit cover plastic can act as a as an underlayer or um, when I'm doing zero discharge willow systems I use a non-woven geotextile membrane so it's a it's a kind of a fleecy type material and then we sit our 0 0.5 millimeter LDPE liner on top of that and then we put our non-woven geotextile on top of that again and that helps to protect it against stones and I suppose the main thing is just to look at it you know jump in and check it and see what's there and and prepare the site first of all and then just lay your protective material down yep somebody's asking can we get reeds and rushes in bulk you can there'll be a day on my on my field where you can come along with a bucket or many many buckets or a trailer and and dig up um bulrush or branch buried greater pond sedge yellow flag iris i don't have common reed on the site but um but yes if that's needed you can get them and uh, and plant them on but you know from that day so that'll be that'll be coming up at some stage in the future and that'll be free of charge for attendees so so that's one thing to do i also sell them so if you need 6,000 of them for a constructive wetland project for an industrial yard. Just give me a shout, that'd be fine. Sounds good. And I see the question about stagnation of water. I, that's, I'm not... that's the last question, uh, I think, for the night. Is it? Okay. From... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Everyone, that any other questions, just send me an email and I'll get them through to Facebook. Okay. And the question of stagnation, it's not something that I'm concerned about, particularly. I think that the, 
Um, with regards to stagnation, stagnation is an issue where you've got pollution of the water, but if the water is clean, it's simply a pond. You know, it's not, the, the stagnation just isn't a problem. And, um, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't fret over it too much. You know, let it, let it evolve and, and do its thing. If you've got polluted water coming in, then finding ways to filter that water can be, can be very useful. Um, but I wouldn't fret over stagnation. Okay. Thank you all very much great. for the questions. What a, questions. a lot of interest. Great session again. Uh, I hope everyone really enjoyed that. And I, I realize it's a lot of information. Thanks a million, Phelan. You're such a source of, of info. Uh, thanks for doing this. And um, I will be sending everyone an email with the link to this presentation, but also with the slides that Phelan showed in his presentation. So you can go over that yourself and let us know if you have any questions. And we're happy to have you on board. Thanks very much, guys. I'm going to end this session now. Thanks, Marine Karen. Thank you.